Hello, friends. Welcome back to ABN's training channel for another episode of Islam and the News. Today is Friday, November 3rd, and the year of our Lord, 2017. And as, as usual, I'm here with another hour's worth of news headlines that you will not get in the mainstream media. And if they happen to mention one of them, they will not give you the other side of the story. They won't give you the pictures. They won't give you the videos that you get only here in Islam and the news. We thank you so much for tuning in every single week for an hour's worth of news that you don't find anywhere else. And of course, all the stuff that you get here at the training channel that you don't get from other television networks out there. That's why we're so thankful for you to uh, continue to pray for us and for your financial support, which will allow all these vital shows to continue, all of the weekly shows, as well as the international apologetics marathons, as well as all the technology that we've uh, set up for uh, you to access all of the shows better because now not only can you watch them live through the trinitychannel.com but you can watch them on any apple or android device on roku amazon fire stick tv Ro um, amazon fire stick tv apple tv the list goes on and on so just go to trinitychannel.com forward slash platforms and you'll see multiple ways that you can watch these shows every single week of course if you happen to miss a live show you can go to the Turney Channel's YouTube channel or to my Vimeo channel, vimeo.com, that's V-I-M-E-O.com forward slash Tony Grillet, and you'll be able to find all of the weekly shows that I do as well. Thank you so much again for being here. Continue to let other people know about Islam in the news. Uh, your Islamic news source is what we call it because we have a variety of stuff. I go usually through probably about 100 different websites in order to find news that people need to know about. And again, you don't get it in the mainstream media. So thank you for being here. Thank you for letting other people know about this as well. Getting to the news I have here from VOA, U.S. targets Islamic State in northern Somalia. Yes, it says U.S. airstrikes Friday targeted Islamic State fighters in northern Somalia, defense officials told VOA. U.S. Africa Command issued a statement later in the day confirming that the military had killed several terrorists, quote-unquote, in two airstrikes against the terror group. We are currently assessing the results, AFRICOM said. The chairman of the town of Kondala, Jama Mohamed Kurshi, told VOA Somali that several missiles had hit a base for IS militants at Buka village, 60 kilometers south of his town in the semi-autonomous region of Puntland. So we have to definitely stay uh, connected to that news story. And of course, these continued news stories that are happening every single week where we see uh, collaborative uh, forces who are fighting IS. Of course, certain countries have been fighting them longer than others have. But at least now, as I talked about in previous weeks, uh, IS, their numbers continue to dwindle down uh, smaller and smaller. Here from Alma News, or AMN, I have Iraqi army enters last ISIS stronghold, recaptures al Qaim border crossing. Moments ago, the Iraqi army officially entered the imperative city of Al Qaim from its eastern gates after thrusting through the desert of western Anbar overnight, scoring a humongous advance along the M12 highway that runs adjacent to the Euphrates River. Although most of the city remains under Islamic State control for now, fierce clashes are unfolding as we speak with heavily armed elements of the Iraqi army's 9th Division. Popular mobilization units, PMU, in Kataib Hezbollah, going from door to door to detect and eliminate ISIS members. Preliminary reports even suggest the Iraqi army has liberated the Al Qaim border crossing at the northwestern gates of the city, indicating a total collapse among I ISIS ranks and possible tactical retreat. And uh, continuing on with this narrative I have here also from AMN, Syrian army crushes last ditch ISIS counteroffensive at al Mayadeen. On Thursday morning, the Syrian Arab army, SAA, came under heavy fire after an Islamic State contingent launched a desperate counter assault in the southern part of Deir Zor province. Briefly reopening the, the al Mayadeen frontier, jihadist combatants chain, uh, charged towards a strategic outpost on the southwestern flank of al-Mahan 
town, but were met by fierce resistance from an entrenched SAA unit. The short-lived counteroffensive then ended in complete disaster for ISIS commanders, whom called off the assault shortly after it began as Syrian troops destroyed a machine gun manned technical along with a modified armored vehicle. Furthermore, over 10 ISIS members were left dead on the battlefield in the wake of the attack, while flies quickly swarmed their decomposing corpses. Out of World Watch Monitor, I have Nineveh Christians still talk of immigration despite Iraqi Kurd peace agreement. Christians in Kirkuk and, uh, and other parts of northern Iraq continue to worry about insecurity in the Nineveh Plains despite the recent peace agreement between Kurdish and Iraqi forces. Recent clashes between the Kurdish per per Peshmerga and the combined forces of the Iraqi army and al hasht al-Shabi, the pro-Iraqi militia groups, destabilized the area once again. The Kurds had controlled Kirkuk uh, Kirkuk since mid-2014 when the Iraqi army fled the Islamic State group offensive. On October 16th, Iraq took back control, and tensions grew worse between the two sides after the Kurdish independence was favored by a majority vote at the September ref referendum. Also from World Watch Monitor, I have Egypt Church reopened after 22 years seen by some as gesture to the U.S., a Pentecostal church in Minya City, Egypt, reopened its doors on Sunday after 22 years without a permit, a move some see as a goodwill gesture from the government ahead of the visit of U.S. Vice President Mike Pence. Pence announced last week that he hoped to visit Israel and Egypt in late December at the same time as he announced the U.S. government planned to bypass an ineffective U.N. and send aid directly to persecuted Christians in the Middle East. In recent weeks, Coptic Christians in Egypt's Minya governorate have seen a number of their churches closed by police following harassments and attacks by Muslim villagers. The affected church communities have been forced to find alternative places of worship, which often means traveling to a neighboring village. From Breitbart News, speaking of Egypt, I have Egyptian lawyer says it is a national duty for men to rape girls who wear ripped jeans. An Egyptian lawyer has sparked outrage after telling a national television audience it is his patriotic and national duty to harass and rape young girls who wear revealing clothes, including ripped jeans, believe it or not. Nabi Al-Wash said women wearing clothing should be punished. He warned... Are you happy when you see a girl walking down the street with half of her behind showing? I say that when a girl walks about like that, it is a patriotic duty to sexually harass her and nationally, and, and a national duty to rape her. Yes, it actually says that here, believe it or not. It is a national duty to rape her. This is coming out of Egypt, which is no surprise uh, to some people, of course, a uh, huge surprise to others. But it says here, the shock remarks came in a panel show broadcast on Al Asema during a debate over a draft law on prostitution and sparked outrage across the country. Egypt's National Council for Women now plans to file a complaint against the lawyer and the TV channel. The council also urged media outlets not to host controversial figures who make remarks that incite violence against women. And of course, coming up here in a bit, I have a new story which will let you know that this guy's remark was not needed in any way. Uh, this is almost sugarcoating it in a sense by saying that uh, a remark like this is what causes it. It is not whatsoever. This stuff has actually uh, been going on for a while. Let me make sure I have all my um, uh, stuff in order here. Now, the reason uh, this is no surprise is just because of what has happened in Egypt uh, ever since uh, Hassan al-Banna uh, established the al hikwan al-Muslimin, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, back in 1928, and the work of the Muslim Brotherhood and how that has influenced Egypt and, of course, just uh, the uh, history of Egypt in the last uh, 80, 80 years or so.
There's a very interesting article that came that was posted to the real side with Joe Messina. Uh, this was written by Sherry Berens, who is, gives a, a lot of great material on online on her website and also through social media. But the name of this article that she he had had uh, she had posted here is called "I Witnessed Firsthand Just How Quickly a Country Can Be Lost." Now, I want to read this entire article to you. I want you to to listen very closely. And, and know that not only has this happened in Egypt, but listen to how this resembles things that are happening in the West, especially as the Muslim Brotherhood continues to work very hard, perhaps even harder than the jihadists out there. Of course, the Muslim Brotherhood has the same end goal, but they're working on a different timeline and they have a different method of operation. Listen to this here. Their intent was obvious. They did not want future generations to know their own history. With it gone from textbooks within a short period of time, no one would know their history, nor could they fight for it. More importantly, they wanted to remove nationalistic pride. Nationalistic pride is important for unity. Within one week after the Brotherhood took power, the Egyptian national anthem was banned from being played on the radio. On some stations, it had been played every hour and gave people a sense of their past and their achievements as united people. I could go on giving examples, but I think you guys need to start making plans to take your country back. There are subversive groups taking your country, and things can move faster than you think they can. I witnessed firsthand just how quickly a country can be lost. Because you see, they've been organizing and planning for many years, decades. So when they make their final moves, it happens so fast it makes your head spin. From January 2011 to August 2013, there was daily violence in the streets throughout Egypt. It was a constant ongoing buildup of violent protests, quote unquote. Mobs of Muslim Brotherhood protesters, quote unquote, were in the streets physically taking away the rights of the average Egyptian. By the people, uh, so I'm sorry, but the people prevailed and they did it peacefully unarmed by coming out in such large numbers that no Muslim Brotherhood could touch them. But first, they organized. It took a few months, but they did it via Facebook and Twitter. Um, in the photo that you saw there, which we can show again, uh, is, is what they dealt with on an ongoing basis. It also says, and P.S., one of the things they did was disable the police force. They did this with accusations of police brutality. Over time, the police were impotent and didn't stop the protesters, quote unquote, for fear of being called abusive. After a few months, the police didn't come out. They were told to stand down. Now, listen to the history of Egypt and what has happened there and things that we're seeing in the West. We see this Antifa, right? who is going out and creating chaos for your average American because they are just against everything America stands for and, of course, are willing to work with the left. And this, they have this, this, the same end goal, it seems, of the jihadists who just want to destroy America. Now, of course, you would think Antifa doesn't want to Islamize the U.S., but that is what, of course, uh, Islam would like or what the goal of Islam is to have the whole world under Sharia to have the whole world Islamized or under the Dar al-Islam, which is the house of peace and not, not peaceful, but house of peace in, in regard to no more Dar al-Harb, no more house of war. Although any country that is under Sharia today still isn't peaceful, quote unquote, as you can see, you still have Sunnis and Shias killing each other and of, of course killing other people as well. But again, I want you to share the show with people just for the, the fact of that story that I just read right there because people in the West need to hear what has happened in other countries and how this comes about. It's a slow Islamization. There's slow steps to cause all of this. And so again, a very important um, news article there from Sherry Berens. Now, speaking of Egypt, and again, speaking of the Muslim Brotherhood who was created in Egypt in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna, uh, Hassan al-Banna's grandson is Tariq Ramadan. And I have here from The Telegraph, this came out just about um, 
uh, a week and a half ago, but I've actually been waiting for more details to come out about it. But the, the headline here is Oxford University Islamic professor denies rape allegations by French feminist author. We have a number of pictures to show you here as I share a couple of stories, but this is a continued um, narrative of what is what is what came out. Professor, a professor of Islamic studies at Oxford University who has advised the government on countering extremism has been accused of rape by a French feminist author. Professor Tariq Ramadan, 55. Let's show you the, the pictures a little bit slower so you guys can soak those up. Um, we don't need to, to go too fast on those. We have a number of pictures here, though. But uh, Professor Tariq Ramadan, 55 years old, was said to have attacked Henda Aryari after inviting her to his hotel room following a conference on Islam in Paris in 2012. So Tariq Ramadan, that, the guy who you just saw right there, that is the grandson of Hassan Albana, the, the guy who in 1928 founded the Muslim Brotherhood, who has front groups throughout the, the world and especially here in America. Uh, many, many front groups that fall underneath the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, none of them have Muslim Brotherhood on their sign out front you know, next to the street, but they are front groups and have the same goal as the Muslim Brotherhood, who again has the same goal as the jihadists, but they aren't carrying guns, they're wearing suits. And they're same, they're, they have the common goal of wanting the world to be under Sharia. But unlike the jihadists and the Salafis, the Muslim Brotherhood are willing to uh, modernize but they still don't want to westernize. They want to change the West and have it come under Islamization. And they're patient. They're willing to work with a 100-year timeline if they have to. And of course, look at how successful they've been between 1928 and now, not just in Eastern countries, but even here in the West. Uh, it says here, the 40-year-old author who spoke out about the, and this is referring to the woman here, who spoke out about the allegations on social media, claimed she had decided to name and shame Professor Ramadan as a pervert guru following the Harvey uh, Weinstein scandal. This Harvey Weinstein scandal is the whole thing that's happening in Hollywood right now. We have all kinds of Hollywood actors who are coming out and pointing fingers at, at, at particular executives and whoever else. Um, you know, when one person's brave enough to come out, it seems like that draws other people out as well. So this lady is saying, hey, she was um, motivated by this. And it says that she confirmed to the Telegraph that she had filed allegations against Professor Ramadan for rape, sexual assault, violence, harassment, and intimidation with the prosecutor's office in Ro Rowan. Now, uh, since this news story came out, and that was the, 20, the 21st of October, I believe, on October 30th, uh, uh, from the Geller Report, Pamela Geller, she came out uh, also with a picture of Tariq Ramadan, and it says, third woman accuses elite jihad propagandist Tariq Ramadan of sexual harassment. So now, the pictures that you just saw of that lady, uh, she was the first one, then we had a second, now we have a third. It says here, Tariq Ramadan's first rape victim was courageous to come forward. She's one of many. Her bravery paved the way for Ramadan's numerous other victims. Ramadan countered all their silence because of the subclass status of women under Islam. Tariq Ramadan is a Muslim. He holds the same beliefs and attitudes toward women that the, that the Muslim rape gangs in the UK and the Muslim migrant rapists in Germany and Sweden and elsewhere hold. This is the behavior toward women that Islam inculcates in men. After, e I'm sorry, even a silver-tongued snake like Ramadan can't hide his true demeanor forever. His contempt for the West makes him all the more revered by leftist elites. He is an Oxford professor. Is his position in jeopardy? He should be fired or at least suspended until these cases are heard before a court of law, but don't count on it. Ramadan was named by Time Magazine as one of the seven religious innovators of the 21st century and as one of the 100 most influential people in the world and by foreign policy readers as one of the top 100 most influential thinkers in the world and global thinkers. Now, much like his grandfather, Hassan Albana, yes, he was an innovative thinker. He was obviously a, a smart guy. But the thing is, is that along with that intelligence, uh, what did he use it for? Did he use it for the good or for the bad? Well, if you asked him, hey, 
It was for the good. The world should be under Sharia. So this is a good thing. And of course, that is going to be the mindset mindset of any jihadist or especially political Islamist. And again, Hassan al-Banna is someone who people need to look to. And again, he is the grandfather of Tariq Ramadan, who this story is about. Now, uh, Pamela just put out a new story today, continuing on with the story of Tariq Ramadan. And it says Tariq Ramadan and the Zionist plot. So yes, believe it or not, this story has been evolving in the news. By now, three women claiming to be his victims have come forward, accusing Oxford University professor Tariq Ramadan of rape, blackmail, and sexual violence with great brutality. Now, these charges are being described by Ramadan supporters as a Zionist plot. As no details of this so-called plot have been revealed, I decided to supply a possible script, a fantastic tale which others are free to use as long as payment, which I don't think need to be specified here, is provided by Ramadan's loyal friends in the Arab Gulf. Now, if you want to read that story that Pamela put together, just go to PamelaGeller.com. You'll be able to read all the details in that. But um, this is what one news story calls the old Arab fear tactic that came to Washington. This is out of Gatestone Institute. It says, the true threat to the U.S., the West, and even stable Arab governments, as Egypt is realizing, is political Islam as furthered by groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and their offshoots. This real threat has become a terrible burden to every Muslim head of state and is behind all the political chaos, coups, and revolutions currently raging throughout the Islamic world. In a chaotic propaganda-prone area of the world, Qatar's Al Jazeera has always reported sympathetically about Islamist groups and promoters of Sharia and against moderate Arab leaders. No moderate leader could survive under such conditions. It is unfortunate that the tactics of the Arab media to accuse people of collusion in order to silence any opposition have now moved into U.S. mainstream media regarding Trump and Russia which the U.S. media would apparently like to regard as their new enemies, quote unquote. This is the same media that defends Sharia law and inaccurately insists that Muslim terrorists who shout Allahu Akbar have, quote, nothing to do with Islam. Now, if you've seen the news in the last few days, you have seen a new terror attack that is in the news that happened in New York, and it's surrounding this uh, proclamation, Allahu Akbar. And what does that mean? Well, as I had said, the uh, mainstream media wants to tell you that uh, it, it what it really means. And this is actually a new story, as you see here from CNN, what Allahu Akbar really means. I'll never forget the day a U.S. Army veteran who had fought in Iraq embraced Islam at my former mosque in New Orleans. He arrived in his full uniform, and was overcome with emotion when he heard the congregation shout Allahu Akbar after he uttered the Islamic declaration of faith. Now, if you want to see this new story and others completely destroyed, let's put up that last picture again real quick. Uh, that is a screenshot, because if you go to answeringmuslims.com, you can see David Wood destroy this CNN opinion piece as well, or maybe not opinion piece, it's something, pretty much an opinion, because it's not, a, it's not accurate news, of course, fake news. But uh, yeah, by Imam Omar Suleiman, and what Allahu Akbar really means. Uh, David mentions this news article as well as others. And again, as usual, he destroys this um, absurd narrative that it means uh, celebration of life or other things that people try, try to say that it means all the time. Now, I want to... Um, you know, David counters counters this as far as these these recent news stories that are out and stuff. I want to uh, point you to some videos so I so that you can actually uh, choose decide for yourself uh, what kind of uh, demeanor or attitude seems to be behind uh, this uh, proclamation of Allahu Akbar. And I have here. Let me get it. Uh, this is actually from Robert Spencer's Jihad Watch, and this came out actually in December of 2015, but of course, completely relevant news story to this, again, once again, uh, narrative that's in the mainstream media. 
And Robert Spencer says, at Bre uh, Allahu Akbar doesn't mean what media says it means. It says here, uh, media outlets routinely mangle the true meaning of Allahu Akbar, the ubiquitous battle cry of Islamic jihadists as they commit mass murder. The war cry is mis mistranslated in the Western media as God is great, but the actual meaning is Allah is greater, meaning Allah is greater than your God or government. So sometimes people get it right and they say, yeah, this means uh, uh, Allah is greater, not Allah is uh, greatest or just God is great, which of course there's certain media places who just take out the Allahu Akbar. They don't want to connect it to anything Arab or anything like that, or even more so than that, uh, Islamic. And they just say, oh yeah, God is great. And that isn't what the person yelled. They yelled Allahu Akbar, which of course has a different, um, not just connotation, but denotation to it. Because anyone can yell God is great, but if someone is saying Allahu Akbar, well, they have a idea of what God is like. And it's the Islamic Allah, the Islamic God, not the God of the Bible who they have in mind. Now, I have a few different videos here for you. And this first one is actually found on this article from Robert Spencer that came out in December of 2015. Now, let's go and play this uh, first video for you. And then I will explain to you and interpret for you uh, the Allahu Akbars that you hear. So let's go and play this first video for you now. So uh, let me explain here or read to you what Robert Spencer has, because you, you keep hearing these different tones in, the, in their voice, right? But they keep saying Allahu Akbar over and over again. So he says here, first come the fervent, please make it work, Allahu Akbars. And then the excited, wow, it's working, Allahu Akbars. Followed by, as the rocket fails, the resigned, too bad, Allahu Akbars. The apologetic, we're sorry, please forgive us. And the reassuring, Allah is still on our team, Allahu Akbar's. So really, Allahu Akbar means, uh, yes, God, uh, God is uh, greater, but it also can mean a lot of things. And usually it has to do with all of these different jihadist um, attacks that we see. Now, in, in that regard, in that particular video, uh, Robert Spencer was interpreting those different Allahu Akbars here for us. Let's go ahead and play the next video for you, and let's listen to what you hear yelled in this one and what it means. Now that didn't sound like a celebration of life, didn't it? Didn't sound like, hey, looks like somebody's in trouble. Let's go get some fire extinguishers. Let's go help uh, put out this fire that the the that is happens to be on this helicopter. Uh, let's go help this person who is in need. Let's go celebrate this life of this man who has skills to fly a helicopter. No, it is people who are wanting to kill someone. And of course, yelling Allahu Akbar, God is greater, greater than uh, this oppressive force that is flying over us or anything like that. God is greater than anything that is out there is the thing which these people have in mind when they are yelling it. Now, of course, it is said by people when they're celebrating something, but that doesn't negate the fact that it is also yelled when all of these terrorist attacks happen. But it also means more than that as well, or of course it can be yelled in other situations which aren't peaceful either. So we have a third video here for you. Let's go ahead and play that one for you now. <laughs> Allah Akbar! 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 Allah
So despite what the mainstream media wants to feed you and hope that you uh, believe, uh, that wasn't a celebration of life either. That was actually a video from Egypt when uh, Christian women are raped to the screams of Allahu Akbar. And as you can see in this next picture here as well, uh, Egyptian girls who don't wear the headscarves get harassed on a daily basis. That video I uh, get from uh, Raymond Ibrahim quite a while back on his website. But this picture here is a more recent one. And again, uh, as I said, the earlier news story that I talked about where some people got mad about that guy in Egypt saying, oh, women who, uh, you know, they should be they should be raped if they wear ripped jeans or whatever else, they should be harassed. People are mad and they should be mad about that. But that was not uh, necessary for these things to happen. Like I said, that video, that was much before this guy just came out recently and said this. Again, Egyptian girls are harassed all the time just for not wearing the hijab or being covered up by anything else other than that. Now, uh, a, a tweet that was sent out, I believe this was uh, February, uh, February 2nd of 2016. Uh, this is something that I responded to on Facebook, this one here, um, regardless of the person's name. It just says, I heard Ted Cruz's first words on his Iowa caucus win, to God goes the glory. That's Republican for Allahu Akbar. Now, as you can see in my reply here, um, when I post this on Facebook, I said, although it may have simply been an attempt at humor by Miss Omri, it is technically a false analogy on her part as well. Cruz's proclamation of to God goes the glory is his response to the results of a constitutional republic slash democratic voting process. Islam and democracy are not compatible, and democracy, quote unquote, is commonly considered a form of shirk because it puts man's law above God's law. The most precise translation of Allahu Akbar is not God is great, but rather God is greater. They commonly shout because they believe he is greater than everything, including democracy. And yes, uh, shirk being the worst sin a person can commit, not just putting man's law above God's law, but even believing that Jesus is the eternal son of God incarnate is also considered shirk because you are basically saying that God has a partner. Now, of course, uh, no Muslim uh, understands the incarnation or even the theology or doctrine of it. That's why they continue to you know, put up straw men to try to destroy. Uh, but nonetheless, um, this whole narrative here of Allahu Akbar and what it means or doesn't mean, uh, it, it goes right back to this to this recent news that came out. This is actually from Time magazine. Women's March organizer Linda Sarsour spoke of jihad, but she wasn't talking about violence. So it's like, hey, Allahu Akbar doesn't doesn't mean a bad thing. Uh, it, it never means a bad thing. It means celebration of life. Uh, jihad. Oh, she wasn't talking about violence. So. Uh, I also have here, uh, it, this is again something that I, I posted in response, Linda's right, no need. No one needs to be concerned about this because when you translate my jihad, it simply means my struggle. In other words, mein Kampf. And mein Kampf has never been an issue for anyone. Now, of course, uh, sarcasm aside there, what is mein Kampf? Well, that is uh, Hitler's bi autobiography. Uh, that is a book that Hitler wrote. And speaking of mein Kampf, Hassan al-Banna, again, the grandfather of Tariq Ramadan, he was a huge fan of Hitler, and he actually had Mein Kampf translated into Arabic. So we see that um, anti-Semitism or uh, Islamic Jew hatred uh, isn't just a recent uh, thing that came about. Uh, this started with Muhammad himself. When the Jews rejected Muhammad, Muhammad rejected the Jews. They didn't believe that he was a true prophet. And of course, you know, he had his guys behead uh, 600, 800, some people say as, as high as 900 Jews in one day uh, after the Battle of the Trench. And uh, we actually did a story, a uh, story, a show in the recent uh, Second International Apologetics Marathon of 2017, um, the origin and history of Islamic Jew hatred. So if you didn't see that video, it'd be good to go see that either on the Train Channel's YouTube channel or again on my Vimeo channel, vimeo.com forward slash Tony Grudelay. Now, uh, 
she says it doesn't it, it doesn't it doesn't talk about violence um, all the time. You know, jihad is anything that furthers the cause of Allah. And she's saying, oh, it doesn't talk about it doesn't talk about violence. Uh, the interesting thing here, and here's a couple more pictures I have for you. Uh, this is the whole uh, distinction between the East and the West. Here in the West, people can get away with oh, jihad. Uh, it is 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 never is never talking about violence. Allahu Akbar is never. Um, a, a battle cry. It's just simply a celebration of life uh, or whatever else. Uh, as you see in this next picture, uh, you actually see uh, LGBT group. This is lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, transgender. As you can see here, no to Islamophobia, no to racism and fascism, yes to equality and diversity. LGBT against Islamophobia. So here in the West, you see um, the LGBT crowd actually working with uh, Islamists and working with Muslims. Now, what's very interesting is that you don't see this in the East. Actually, this next picture here is how um, uh, LGBT are treated in the East in countries under Sharia. Uh, yeah, you don't find Muslims wanting to work with the LGBT crowds. Uh, instead, they're throwing them off roofs. So uh, a huge contrast between what happens to gay people, lesbian transgender, bisexual in the East, compared to here in the West, where you have the ignorant uh, left or LGBT uh, standing up or wanting to work with, with uh, the Islamists or the political Islamists. So uh, moving on to bare naked Islam, I have here hate hoaxes, question mark. Two New Jersey mosques, including one attended by the terrorist who killed eight and injured 12 in New York City, allege they have received phone call threats. Designated terrorist group CARE, C-A-I-R, yes, they have uh, business offices or uh, um, Council on American Islamic Relation offices, I should say, uh, throughout the United States, uh, demands a federal hate crime, quote unquote, investigations of these alleged phone calls. And then it says here, yawn. Me thinks that law enforcement is sick to death of CARE's never-ending demands for hate crime investigations, which rarely ever turn out to be what they say they are. So we have a video with, for you from this news story here. So let's go ahead and play that for you now. Muslims in New Jersey are on edge following a series of threats to a local mosque. Today, New York's Tracy Strayhands in Patterson with more on what may be sparking these menacing messages. Tracy. Well, Darlene, they are in the midst of the first of the five daily prayers here at the Islamic Cultural Center of Passaic County. And we actually spoke to a man before this that expressed his real anger, not only that they've been receiving phone threats here, but that the Muslim community is being linked to what happened in Tribeca at all. Let's show you video of the center that's home to 25,000 congregants, at least 2,000 each day. Now, the Islamic Cultural Center here has reportedly received at least eight telephone threats, calls threatening violence and damage to the center. The Council of American Islamic Relations is urging Islamic institutions like this one to take extra security precautions as a result of this. CARE also reported another mosque here in Patterson has received the same type of threats after word spread that the sun suspect in the Tribeca attacks may have worshipped there. Now, neighbors say the, they've never seen him in that area and, of course, that his acts certainly aren't representative of the Muslim religion. CARE is still calling on state and federal officials to try and investigate these phone threats as possible hate crimes. We're also standing by to see if they're beefed up security in this area. Darlene Patterson is the second largest Muslim American community in this country. They faced this type of backlash in the past. They're certainly angry that they have to deal with this all over again. Back to you. Now, we have the statement that uh, these acts have nothing to do with the Muslim religion. Well, we have to ask some follow-up questions, of course. What is the Muslim religion? Well, that is Islam. Who founded Islam? Uh, that was Muhammad, the supposed prophet who was born in 570, who uh, in 610 supposedly received a first revelation from the angel Jabril or Gabriel. A couple of years later, started preaching, right? And he didn't have a whole lot of followers in Mecca, but what happened you know, in 622, he fled to Medina. This is the Hijra. It's not just when he fled to Medina, but this was also the beginning of the Islamic calendar. That's why you, when you look at any Islamic source, it has the letters A-H after the year. 
rather than AD, AD being Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. This is like open up every single Islam in the news show every single Friday. But this started the Islamic calendar. This was Muhammad uh, fleeing Mecca to Medina. That's where he became a political leader, a religious leader, a military leader. He founded the first Islamic state, okay? And uh, Muhammad said, I have been made victorious through terror. So if the supposed perfect man and perfect Muslim, which is exactly what Islam says about Muhammad, was victorious through terror, why should we be surprised when some of his most devout followers commit terrorist acts as well? And in spite of that, you have, again, this, this watered-down, sugar-coated Walt Disney version of Islam that keeps being uh, spoon-fed to people from the mainstream media who doesn't do their research. And who do they have represent Islam every single time? Usually a care representative, again, a, a front group of the Muslim Brotherhood who's working even harder than the jihadists are, but they're not carrying guns. That's why they don't make the nightly news um, in that regard, but they do make the nightly news many times because they are the exact people who the media invites to come and respond to uh, statements about Islam or just about a, a new story surrounding a Muslim in general. So we have another video for you here, here you now, and this gives you a little bit more information. So let's go and play that for you. Thank you. There does seem to be some fallout here in Atlanta. Police responded swarming Atlantic Station last night after someone left a book bag in the parking garage. Someone said, quote, an Arab man left it there. That was not confirmed. CBS 46's Yasmina Olsen is there live. Uh, Yasmina, because this happened just hours after the terror attack in Manhattan, are some now making a connection, specifically reaction to this perceived threat? Well, I asked the executive director at the Council on American Islamic Relations here in Atlanta about the incident here at Atlantic Station, as well as with what happened in New York. And while he says it's good to be safe, he says you should be careful not to stereotype. Edward Mitchell walks into these doors every day to fight for those who can't always do it alone. His main focus is countering anti-Muslim discrimination, much like the NAACP defends African Americans from racism, CARE defends American Muslims from Islamophobia. The job Mitchell and others in his office do is most important right now. There's been a sharp rise in anti-Muslim hate crimes. Uh, there's been a sharp rise in anti-Muslim sentiment, and it's largely been brought on by uh, both politicians spreading Islamophobia and terrorist groups engaging in these horrific acts. One of Mitchell's main jobs is to showcase that Islam is not defined by the actions of a few. We don't blame uh, Christianity for the KKK, just like we don't blame patriotism uh, for Timothy McVeigh. No one should blame American Muslims or Islam for the actions of these homicidal lunatics. But he admits it does happen. A very small minority of bigoted people think otherwise. A very small minority of bigots will engage in violence against Muslims. Then there's the stereotyping. We told Mitchell about an incident at Atlantic Station, a call claiming an Arab man left a book bag in the parking deck. See someone leave a bag on the floor at the airport and walk away, that's suspicious. If you see someone leave a bag on the floor at a mall and walk away, maybe a little less suspicious, but it's fine to report that. His response was simple. The person's race or faith does not matter. It's their behavior that should matter. And Mitchell says the biggest change that he'd like to see is for people to educate themselves on Islam and trying not to stereotype. He also says that the most anti-Muslim bigotry that they see comes during election time from politicians rather than after acts of terrorism. Yeah, Asmita, here in Atlanta, how many cases does the Council of American Islamic Relations work on the average? Mitchell says obviously they work on a ton of cases here in Atlanta, but right now they have about a dozen active cases, and some of those are legal cases, and some of them are not. Sharon? Yes, we know Austin Forrest, uh, live in Atlanta. So once again, we have a care representative, right, a front group uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he uses uh, two of the four very popular terms that they usually call people. It's all, it's all about name calling here in the West. You don't we don't have any blasphemy laws that uh, can result in your death or being put in prison or being fined, or it's not like even Australia where they have restrictions on speech. Yes, here where you still have freedom of speech, the, um, the punishment for criticizing Islam, which is uh, again, punishable by death if you're living under Sharia, is name calling. So what did he call people? He called them Islamophobes. He called them bigots. 
The other two popular names that you're called are racist, which doesn't even make sense because Islam is a religion and not a race. And the other one is intolerant. And if you haven't seen it, go to watch my video on the Muslim Brotherhood or on unveiling the facts of Sharia. You can find it on my Vimeo, Vimeo channel, vimeo.com forward slash Tony Grillet. And I explain how each of these four uh, names, these ad hominem attacks uh, fall apart. But what's he doing as well? He he, he, he pulls a two quoque, which is basically a U2 argument. Oh, Islam is violent. Oh, well, look at the Old Testament. Look at Christianity, you know, which, again, um, don't have time to go in, into in responding to that, uh, which is also a ridiculous claim. Uh, but just continuing on with what, what he was saying, he was saying, oh, yeah, uh, we don't blame, um, uh, you know, the KKK on Christianity. Well, number one. Uh, the KKK don't do what Jesus said to do. So even if they said they were Christian, which I don't know of any who do, uh, if they're not look, doing what Jesus said to do, well, then they aren't truly Christians. He says, oh, look at Timothy McVeigh. Well, this guy needs to read a book, perhaps, called uh, The Third Terrorist, The Middle East Connection to the Oklahoma City Bombing. Uh, that might educate him on who Timothy McVeigh was, um, rather than, again, using complete straw man to try to um, say, oh yeah, you know, ISIS is an Islamic because they're killing Muslims. Well, you make that claim, well, you're begging the question. Uh, uh, ISIS would say, well, no, they're not Muslims. That's where we're killing them. You know, Sunnis and Shias have been killing each other for 1,400 years, and that was way before ISIS. And uh, they both claim to be Muslims, right? But why are they killing the other person? Because they say, well, you're not a Muslim. So they've been killing each other for the same reason that ISIS kills people, because the Quran talks about not only killing um, non-Muslims, but also talks about killing hypocrites. And ISIS says, well, these moderate nominal Muslims uh, are hypocrites. They're not true Muslims. Because if they were, they'd be doing what we're doing. So anyway, uh, once again, an another uh, carbon copy image of a uh, political Islamist um, who, who uh, works for care and tries to feed people this, again, watered down, sugar coated version of Islam that doesn't line up with the primary sources. Even the news lady said there, hey, we want to, they want to encourage people to, to study Islam. Well, okay, do that. Look at the Quran, look at the Hadith, look at the Sirah literature, the biographies of Muhammad, look at the Tahri, which is the history, uh, 39 volume set by Al Tabari. Uh, there's a whole lot of sources we can point you to, and they're not going to be the ones that care points you to or uh, other um, people who work with them uh, either. Now, I have here from Clarion Project. It says uh, three things about the New York attack you might not be hearing. Number one, it was not a lone wolf attack. Number two, the, his mosque was under surveillance. And at number three, the attack was based on ideology. I would recommend that you go to clarionproject.org to find out this, uh, to, to read the details, I should say, of this article. Again, three things about the New York attack, or it says here, NY attack, you might not be hearing. But what I do want to show you is the video that is found at the bottom of this news story. So let's go ahead and play that for you now. Deadliest shooting in U.S. history. Terror in New York. A driver intentionally slams into a crowd before crashing into a school bus. Eight dead and more than a dozen injured. The deadliest terror attack in New York City since 9-11. This was an act of terror aimed at innocent civilians. The FBI has opened terrorism investigations in all of our 50 states. So we want to thank Clarion Project for being on the front lines. Go to Clarion Project and find that video. Again, other articles they put out as well. But not everyone is out there trying to inform people. We have here from Gates Zone Institute, Facebook, social media, aiding jihad, censoring those who counter jihad. That major technology companies are openly stifling the free speech of people trying to counter jihad is bad enough. What is beyond unconscionable is that they are that they simultaneously enable Islamic supremacists to spread the very content that the counter jihadists have been exposing. According to the legal complaint, the names and symbols of Palestinian Arab terrorist groups and individuals were known to the authorities and 
Facebook has the data and the capability to cease providing services to such terrorists, but has chosen not to do so, quote unquote, is what it has here. A separate lawsuit claimed that Twitter not only benefits indirectly by seeing its user base swell through the increase of ISIS-linked accounts, but directly profits by placing targeted advertisements on them. And when jihadist content is permitted to spread unchecked across the globe via cyberspace, it is a matter of national and international security. Tragically for Western civilization, its tech and media icons have been colluding, even unwittingly, with those working actively to destroy it. So again, you can find that at gatestoneinstitute.org. Now I have here from Orange County Register, 53% of Muslim students surveyed in California say they've been bullied over religion. CARE, once again, uh, civil rights attorney Marwa Rafahi takes part in a press conference addressing a report documenting faith-based bullying of Muslim students in schools on Monday, October 30th, 2017. The report based on the survey of Muslim students ages 11 to 18 shows that 53% of the students who were surveyed reported some form of bullying. Now, this is unfortunate. No one should be bullied because of um, their religion. Now, of course, a lot of people are gonna bring a whole lot of other things into this equation. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we should stand up for the rights of every American. You know, like I've said before, um, people have the freedom to practice their religion as long in America as long as they don't infringe upon the constitutional rights, the Bill of Rights, uh, the American rights of other Americans. Now, the thing is with Islam, Islam is a religio-political system. It's not just a religion, it's a political ideology. And you cannot ultimately separate the two because this is the system that Muhammad founded, uh, you know, uh, 1400 years ago. So you can't completely divorce the two things here. Now, I, I do want to give you, uh, this is for Christians out there, so especially, because we can't expect a non-Christian to share the gospel with Muslims. Here's a news story that came out. Uh, this was uh, 2015. It says, two men kept from boarding U.S. plane after speaking Arabic. Now, I posted this on my Facebook page because I shared a story of what had happened when I was on a plane uh, right around that time. And I put, this is, this is the post that I put. So um, along with this picture, let's listen closely to the story that I share with you. I had three plane flights last Saturday. On my second one, I had the aisle seat and there were two empty seats next to me. Then shortly before the plane took off, a Middle Eastern man and woman came to my aisle and motioned that the seats next to me were theirs. I stood up and walked into the aisle so they could uh, get past me and sit down. As I did that, I heard, overheard them speaking Arabic. I helped the woman put an item into the overhead bin. Then they sat down and I sat down. As I read a book, they continued to speak Arabic for about 10 minutes or so. And then I attempted to start a conversation to see if they spoke English. The woman did not, but the man did. I learned that, they, that he and his wife were from Iraq and that he had lived in the United States for uh, quite a while, but that she had just got here. I asked him a number of questions about Iraq and what it was like growing up there. Then he told me that he and his wife are Christians, quote unquote. So I swung the conversation to the Bible. He would speak English to me and then Arabic to his wife. I had my Bible in my hands and she had an Arabic Bible app on her phone. Turns out he, didn't, he said he didn't believe in the Trinity or that Jesus is the eternal son of God incarnate. So we talked about it for about an hour and a half. Every few minutes, he would interpret what I said to his wife, and then she would skip around to different verses in her Arabic Bible. Near the end of the conversation, the man said he would like to talk more, so we exchanged contact information. After that, I gave them an English Arabic copy of Josh McDowell's More Than a Carpenter, listen to this, which a friend of mine just happened to give me right before I drove to the airport. And then I asked people to please pray for them. So again, we as Christians are the only hope that Muslims have. We need to be sharing the gospel with them. And that's what I encourage you to do, despite all of these news story, uh, this new stories that we present every single week. Uh, we want to encourage you to, like only uh, Christ can allow you, to love your Muslim neighbors, reach out to them, uh, sh you know, share the love of Christ with them, but most importantly, share the gospel with them, because Muslims need to realize who Jesus truly is. They need to hear and understand the gospel. They need to repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ. So 
stay tuned in to Islam on the News every single Friday to get the news you're not going to get in the mainstream media. Here, we love Muslims because they're people made of the image of God. But at the same time, we critique Islam. We don't sugarcoat it. We critique Islam, the religion, the religio-political system. We critique the Quran. We critique the Islamic sources. We critique Muhammad, the supposed prophet of Islam. And this is a combo that you will not get anywhere else. So please stay tuned to Islam on the News every single Friday, only found here on ABN's Journey Channel. As soon as this video is available online, please get it, share it with other people through social media, as well as through email. Just get the link and mail it out again, vimeo.com forward slash Tony Grulay, as well as Journey Channel's YouTube channel. And until next Friday, God bless you. Good night. Uh, should reach out to everyone around you, not just Muslims, but uh, <laughs> Muslims in particular, because again, that's the largest unreached people group in the world, 1.6 billion people who need the gospel. So prayers go out to you. We thank you so much for joining us. Please come back next Friday for another one-hour episode of Islam and the News.